Okay, so good morning. So I'm going to talk about a related topic, which is thermal properties of a specific liquid, which is graphene nanofluid. So my name is Pablo Ordejon, but actually I'm going to talk about something that I was only incidentally involved. The work was actually done okay, by Francesca Costanzo, who is a postdoc in our institute, in my group, and by Bern Ensig, uh, who is a professor in the University of Amsterdam. So these are the ones uh, that did the work, and I hope I won't say anything too stupid in, in, in my talk. So um, this is part of the MAX project, and this is one of the parts of the project which were supposed to be linking the outputs and the ideas of MAX, the uh, uh, materials modeling, with the needs of the users, and in particular with industry. In MAX, we defined uh, several pilot uh, cases, uh, where we try to uh, address uh, industrial uh, problems of industrial interest. And this is one that came up uh, a few years ago, uh, related to work of a Spanish company, Avengois, and uh, it's a company on uh, energies uh, in general. And at that time, they were very much interested in studying liquids for thermal storage. So the idea is that uh, they, they are a company for uh, they, uh, they have a strong activity in solar energy. So you have these, uh, these uh, plants where you have uh, a lot of mirrors that uh, concentrate the uh, light of the sun in, a, in a, a small spot, and then you heat a fluid and store it. That has the advantage that you have energy even when there is no sun, which is one of the main uh, problems of solar energy. So you heat, you uh, store the energy in a liquid that you store at very high temperature, so you have these huge tanks storing uh, essentially a material which is a molten salt. A molten salt, which is stored at about 500 degrees, then you use it to process electricity, it cools down, and then you circulate it again to the, to the source of, of heat. So you can have energy when there is no sun. This is one of the important things. So um, what uh, materials do they use to store the heat? They use uh, uh, salts that melt, and they are quite common salts. That do, you can have chlorides, like sodium chloride and so on. You can have carbonates, nitrates, or mixtures of all of them. So you, they find which ones are the, the most uh, uh, interesting. Again, they have melting points uh, relatively high, about 200 uh, Celsius, and they operate about 500 uh, Celsius. So, um, of course, they want to use liquids that store uh, heat more efficiently. And one way to do that is to improve the quality, the, pro the thermal properties of the liquid by uh, including nanoparticles in the liquid. This is a very uh, um, um, popular topic. Many, many groups have been doing that. These are two papers that appeared when we started this project in 2014, showing that uh, including quite small amounts of nanoparticles in the uh, molten salts, it would increase the thermal properties quite dramatically. So. Um, there are reports of about uh, even 100% of increase in the, in the heat capacity of these salts just by including uh, small percent amounts of, of these nanoparticles. Uh, so one main problem of this is the accurate quantification. The experiments are not so easy, and there is a quite large dispersion of values. You won't see anything in this table, but this is a table showing uh, increases in the uh, specific heat of uh, certain materials uh, by different authors. So typically you have... Uh, uh, amounts of nanoparticles of about 1% uh, in weight, and you may get in increases in the specific heat of about a few tenths of uh, percent. So it's a quite dramatic increase. And even in some, in some cases, like this one I'm uh, highlighting here, this is graphene nanoparticles in one of these uh, materials. It gets about to about 100% of increase in the thermal property, in the, in the specific heat. So of course, these people wanted to understand why this happens. So uh, to be able to predict and to uh, uh, build liquids which are much better, uh, including nanoparticles. So the questions for us were, uh, can we understand what is going on and predict the thermal properties of the liquid through simulation? Can we get some basic understanding of that? Uh, these are papers that appear also in the same year, so uh, they were uh, computing the thermodynamic properties of the molten salts, like the PV uh, curves, or uh, the uh, effect of the inclusion of nanoparticles in the molten salts. This, uh, this was a silicon nanoparticle, and they saw that the structure of the liquid uh, in the border, in the, in the surface of the nanoparticle, which goes up to here, is quite dramatically uh, affected. So there is some layering, uh, some compressed uh, layer that they claim is the origin of this uh, increase in the thermal properties. <coughs> 
So the pilot that we define is precisely to do that, to try to see uh, with simulation how to improve and why, why the thermal properties of these liquids are improved by the action of the nanoparticles. And this is what we proposed in, in, in MAX. Uh, however, life is tough sometimes. And uh, in the end of 2015, this uh, company, this uh, Spanish company, went into uh, a lot of trouble. These were um, uh, 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 newspapers uh, uh, titulars. Uh, so, for instance, in Forbes, there was this uh, uh, one saying that Spain, Spain's renewable energy powerhouse of Avengoa tears towards uh, bankruptcy. This happened in 2015. And in 2017, it, it actually happened. So, Avengoa went. Uh, uh, Away, uh, so this uh, uh, one from the from El País, the main uh, newspaper in the country, was saying that, uh, that the, the biggest laboratory in the renew renewable energies in Spain had been dismantled. So the, the reasons for that have nothing to do with uh, simulation and the materials. It has to do with finances, and actually the people that were running the company are now being uh, uh, put in trial. So uh, this had a, a, a very uh, a dramatic uh, consequence for us that the people working in that, in the company, went uh, away, of course, and uh, we had to rethink the whole project. So, out of lemons, we made lemonade. So, we thought about what to do with this. We had invested quite a, a few uh, months of time. Uh, so, we we look for a, 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 a different system looking at the same properties. And in, in particular, we, we, are, we, we are looking now at heat transfer fluids. So these are fluids that work at room temperature uh, instead of these uh, molten salts that are used at very high temperatures. And they are used for many things, and Stefano was mentioning a few uh, in his talk. So for instance, cooling and thermal management in uh, devices, in uh, engines, and so on. And again, as I showed you before, graphene is one of the most popular uh, nanoparticles that they use for these nanofluids because it seems to have a particularly large effect in the thermal properties. There's a very large literature on that, uh, and the nice thing is that there are some experimental groups at my institute who are working on that, both of the, on the preparation and stabilization of these uh, nanofluids and in measuring the thermal properties. So in particular, the group of Pedro Gomez at my institute, he's an experimental chemist, he's uh, using organic solvents to disperse uh, uh, nanographite or, nano graphite or graphene nanoflakes. Um, so they have very stable dispersions with very low concentrations, even lower than 1%, uh, uh, than so they, they have a concentration from 0 to 0.05% in weight, so very, very dilute. Uh, but they find quite dramatic effects in the thermal properties. The size of the nanoflakes, about 100 to 400 uh, nanometers in diameter, and the, the number of layers go from 1 to 10. So they refer to them as nanographene. I prefer to call them nano, nanographite flakes. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite long. So um, these are some examples of the kind of uh, results they have. So they, they've been studying, for example, the thermal um, the heat capacity as a function of the concentration of graphite or graphene nanoparticles in the liquid. And again, they have a quite dramatic uh, change. So they can reach values of about 15% 15, 15 for only 0.12% in weight incorporation of graphite. Uh, the thermal conductivity is also very much affected, and you have values which are even larger in the, in the enhancement of the thermal conductivity. This is work, uh, again, in my institute by the group of Sotomayor, who is a physicist working on uh, thermal properties of materials. Okay, so they went a bit uh, ahead of what most people do in this field, which is just compute or uh, uh, determine experimentally the thermal properties. They have tried to go a bit more inside and try to see what happens at the microscopic level. So one of the things they are measuring is the, the vibrational properties of these uh, melts, of these uh, 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 solutions. So, for instance, they are measuring the Raman spectra, and they do find that there is also a quite large change in the sum of the Raman peaks with the incorporation of graphene, the Raman peaks that come from the DMF molecules, so they are DMF uh, vibrations. So, for instance, this peak, which is at uh, 10 and 90 centimeters, it does shift considerably when you increase the number of uh, graphene nanoparticles in the liquid. Uh, so, you have a quite sizable effect again with a very small concentration of, of uh, graphene nanoparticles. They are measuring other things, but I'm going to show you that, just this one. Okay, so the idea was to apply what we had been trying to set up uh, with MAX to do these this, uh, this particular liquids, and we started 
forgetting about the initio, the initio is quite too complicated. These, these systems are very large. And Stefano was mentioning the, the hiccups that you have with the initio. We started trying to understand things uh, in much more simple uh, ways with uh, using uh, classical molecular dynamic simulations, using classical potentials. We used a few of them. Uh, and in particular, well, using this uh, DMF uh, uh, liquid with some model uh, uh, nanoparticles uh, going from single layer graphene, very small to quite uh, bigger, to a few layers uh, graph graphite nanoparticles. Uh, so we were doing molecular dynamics out of this and trying to get solutions. So one of the things in MATS is we, we want to automatize all this process to be able to do the same thing uh, for different materials in a quite automatic level. So uh, we kind of uh, make a catalog of the steps that you have to do in, in these uh, runs. Uh, and this is just an example it doesn't work, of one of the molecular dynamics. You haven't seen these things many times. It doesn't impress you here. Um, but uh, it tells you that in molecular dynamics runs, which are quite long in terms of ab initio uh, simulations, nothing really happens. I mean, you have diffusion, which is much longer time than the uh, uh, simulation time that you have uh, here. So this is something that has to be taken into account when you want to apply a, a initial to these kind of materials. Okay, so what do we get out of the simulations? Uh, the very first thing we looked at is what is the structure of the liquid when the nanoparticles are uh, diluted. So we looked at things like the uh, uh, radial distribution function between uh, dilute and between the solute uh, uh, molecules. So if, for instance, I'm, I'm showing here, this is a simulation of a single uh, graphene nanoflake in a, a large number of, uh, of molecules. So what we should uh, show here is the nitrogen-nitrogen per correlation function as a function of the distance from graphene. So what we are plotting is not the 3D uh, radial distribution function, but a 2D uh, distribution function. We you are, have a nitrogen at a certain distance from graphene. What is the number of molecules in the same plane of that molecule? Okay? And we do that, that as a function of the distance from the molecule to graphene. So we are seeing uh, what is the change in the liquid structure when you get very close to graphene and when you uh, move away. So when you move away, what you have essentially is the single peak, which has to do with first neighbors, and then there is a liquid structure, so everything is relatively flat. You can see that essentially here in this uh, green line. So you have first uh, neighbor's peak, but then everything is relatively flat. Uh, when you move very close to graphene, you have this very sharp peak of first neighbors, which actually happens at a distance longer than the uh, peaks in the, in the liquid. And then you have this very clear uh, 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 structure, which indicates a strong order is within the plane. So what is happening is that the molecules which are close to graphene, in contact with, with graphene, are very much ordered. They are not disordered in the liquid. So you have a very strong uh, first order peak, but then you have second and third neighbors very clearly identifiable. When you move away from that, you still see this order, uh, for a few layers, and then you go to the liquid. So uh, there is a layering, a very clear layering effect. You have a single layer at about, at about um, uh, 3.5 uh, uh, Armstrongs. Then you have a, a, another layer here, another layer here, and so on. So you have a very clear layering, even if it's still a liquid, but it's a very much a structured liquid, much more structured than in the, in the bulk. So you can see that clearly here in this contour process. This is the same thing as this one, but just looking at the contour uh, plots. So you can see very clearly graphene would be here at zero, and you can see here one layer which is very clear and very structured, and then you see a second and even a third layer with much less internal structure. So there is a very strong layering uh, uh, here, and uh, graphene affects very much the structure of the liquid uh, a few layers away from, from graphene. So the thermal properties of the, of the liquid are supposed to change not only because graphene is there, but because the structure of the liquid also changes near Near graphene. This is just a snapshot with a very small flake of, of the molecules which are touching graphene, and you see that uh, all of them, even if they are moving and they are actually diffusing, they do have this uh, planar structure. They are lying flat on the graphene surface, and they form this kind of uh, network uh, around uh, graphene, which moves uh, out, of, out of the plane uh, very, very quickly. Okay, so we wanted to see how is the effect of this, or, or what is the reason for this layering. And we were looking at uh, now electronic structure calculation with DFT. We see that there is very little interaction between the molecules and graphene. Uh, there is, uh, so the, these are the, the, in the frontier orbitals, there is, it's essentially graphene. 
you have to go quite deep in the balance band to see some uh, orbitals due to the molecule. And there is a quite clear pi stacking. So the pi orbitals of the molecule interact with the pi orbitals of graphene. But it's a very weak uh, bonding. You can see that also here. Here we are using this indicator, which was developed by Wei Tao Yang some, some years ago, of the reduced density gradient that allows you to identify what is the uh, characteristics of the bond between two systems. Uh, this this uh, green contours uh, mean that you have a quite weak interaction, which is actually this uh, kind of uh, pi, pi stacking. Okay, so one thing we did with this is try to understand if we could shed, shed some light in the Raman uh, spectra, and we computed what is the Raman, uh, the frequency of this particular Raman peak when you have uh, uh, the, the, uh, the DMF with no graphene, and we have this, this number here. There is another Raman peak that we also measure that we also predict quite well. And we were trying to see how is the uh, effect of graphene in the molecules which are touching graphene on the frequencies. And actually, we see that uh, both peaks uh, increasing in frequency uh, for the molecules which are in direct on contact with graphene, uh, which is in the right direction. We, we don't think, actually, that this is the reason for the shift in the Raman peak, because in the Raman peak, you don't see a superposition of peaks, you see a peak which is uh, quite moving quite rigidly uh, with a half width which is uh, relatively insensitive to the concentration. So we think this is not the reason. We are still trying to understand what's going on. You must have, in order for this to be experimentally observable, you must have a shift in the molecules which are also far away from graphene because the number of molecules touching graphene is very small. It's just a few, uh, it's a fraction of a, of, of a percent. So this cannot be the reason for this whole shift, uh, peak shifting. Okay, we also looked at what is uh, actually industrially important, which is the, the thermal properties, and we started with a specific heat. And here, um, uh, the same way that the thermal conductivity is difficult to get, uh, the, the specific heat is also quite hard. What we did is, uh, okay, so the problem if the liquids is that you have uh, this structure of the, the, the density of states. So if you have the density of states that you can get from simulation, from the velocity of autocorrelation function, you can get the thermal, the, 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 the thermal properties. Of course, you have this, uh, this structure when you have uh, at zero frequency, you have a finite density of states because you have diffusion. But then you have something which is like a mixture of a gas behavior, which is this one for a gas, and a solid behavior for which as uh, the density of states go, go to zero at zero frequency. Now, for a solid, you can work out uh, the thermodynamics using the quasi-harmonic approximation. It's, it's, a, it's a quite good one. For the gas, of course, you cannot do that because you have diffusion and, and harmonicity. But for the solid, this quasi-harmonic approximation allows you to include quantum effects, which, of course, are critical for, for the specific heat. So what we do is to follow a procedure which was proposed a few years ago by the group of Goddard, in which if you, have, if you can have this, um, this uh, splitting of the uh, vibrational density of states into a gas-like behavior and a solid-like behavior, then you can compute thermodynamical properties by adding up these two pieces separately. And for instance, for the solid, you can use the harmonic approximation using just the, 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 the statistical uh, quantum uh, weights, and you can get the, the, the values for, for the thermodynamic properties. So, for instance, for the um, specific heat, you would use this weighting uh, function uh, multiplied by this uh, density of states that come from a solid, which is, which is this one. So, we apply this to uh, this liquid, to DMF, and this is the density of state that you get from the velocity autocorrelation function. Uh, so, if you zoom this thing here and have a, a, a logarithmic scale in the frequencies, you see that the solid one is at, as it should, so you have the, all these peaks here at high frequencies, and you have a, a, a rotational and translational contribution that go uh, to a finite value at finite uh, frequencies, and this is what you treat um, differently from the, from the uh, uh, harmonic uh, uh, frequencies. So using this, this way, it's quite, uh, quite involved, quite complicated, but you can get an estimate of the uh, specific heat, which is about 150, which compares very, very well with the experimental value, which is 148. Of course, this tells also that the, the potential we are using is, is, quite, is quite good. We have started, and this is work which is unfinished, uh, just a very preliminary calculations, seeing how the uh, uh, presence of the particles affect the specific heat. And we have something which we still don't understand very much, 
uh, for some of the sizes we, we consider uh, a, a particular uh, uh, amount of concentration of nanoparticles, but we were changing the size of the particles, keeping the same concentration. And for some uh, sizes of particles, we do see that the nanofluid is considerably more, has more uh, specific heat, higher specific heat than the pure DMF, but for some other particles which are bigger, actually it goes down, which was, goes against the experiment. So we are still trying to analyze and understand these, these results. Okay, and finally, we also did uh, work on the thermal conductivity. Here, you have all the problems that were mentioned by, uh, by Stefano before. We are using, so far, um, empirical, uh, classical force fields, so we can define uh, uh, very easily these, uh, these uh, uh, terms in the, in the heat flux. Uh, so, we are, we are using that for, for computing the, the, the heat capacity, the, 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 the thermal uh, conductance. But you find the other problem that uh, uh, Stefano was, was talking about, which is the noise. It's very noisy. Uh, if you look at time scales of, sorry, of a, a, hand, a few hundreds of picoseconds, you have all this noise. But if you look at even longer time scales, uh, it doesn't really converge. It shifts, and then it kind of goes wild, which may have to do with instabilities in the molecular dynamics or with re-entrance of particles in the other side of the box. We are not sure what, what's going on yet. But actually, we we have to solve these issues to provide some numbers which are reliable. So we have, again, two issues. Uh, can we achieve converse results with much shorter simulation? And this was addressed uh, in the talk of, uh, of Baroni. And then, uh, if we can do that, can we still compute it using Avenition models, which are going to be much better than, than these uh, empirical uh, models? OK, so just an uh, uh, abstract of uh, what I told you on Outlook. We created this uh, workflow for the uh, automatization of the simulations of thermal uh, properties of nanofluids. We are trying to validate these uh, procedures uh, by comparing directly with experimental information provided by some groups in my institute. Uh, we went to uh, this uh, graphene nanoparticles, which is a quite a string case. You have a very large change in the thermal properties, including very small number of uh, nanoparticles, so you should be able to see something quite easily here. Uh, we are trying to identify uh, the microscopic mechanisms, like this layering that I uh, talk about, and we are next trying to adopt these new developments by Stefano and co-workers for the thermal conductivity uh, of these samples. And with this I conclude, and I thank Max for support. Thank you.